Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Grumpy Dads podcast. As always, with us is Chris. Hello, mate. Uh, yeah, and this week we've got another guest, and I'll be throwing the introduction over to you. This is Ben. Ben is actually one of my fellow moderators on my Facebook group uh, for parents of autistic kids. He's also known as the rambling autistic, which I'm sure we're going to experience in the next hour or so. <laughs> and um, he works with autistic people. He's autistic himself, but he's somebody who's just a real inspiration to me. So welcome to the podcast, Ben. Thank you, Hi, everybody. As always uh, on the podcast, with all our guests, we play icebreaker antics. Um, I scour the net for uh, products, and then I go for the one-star reviews. Basically, you've got to guess the product based on the reviews. If you guess it on the first one, you get three stars, two stars for the second review, one star for the final review. The first one, my friends were all on it, so decided to try. I've now lost respect for my friends. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that could be an awful lot of things um, that's got to be some type of vitamin or something ooh ooh that's a good guess yeah that is a very good guess do you, do you want to go with vitamin because I can't I can't say if you're right or not unless you go with vitamin yeah I'll go with vitamin that's alright you're, ro- you're wrong it's fine Duncan what's <laughs> good <laughs> I'm going to go for something along the lines of Snapchat Oh, that's another good guess. No, it's not. But two cracking guesses. Great guess, um, but you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to give you half a star for the really good guesses, but that we, that's not part of the rules. Um, next <laughs> review. Just the weirdest thing, like someone threw up in a blender and threw a rainbow and pink milkshake in. Oh, is it Huel or something like that, like a diet supplement? No, no, it's not a diet supplement. I was going to say, I'm glad you went with that, because that's where I was going. (laughs) (laughs) I I just knew that, and I was getting it wrong on Ben's behalf, so he has a good guess. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know about good guess, that's more taken my guess. (laughs) You've got got another try, Ben. What's uh, what's your take on this? Just the weirdest thing, like someone threw up in a blender and threw a rainbow and pink milkshake in. I will say this is a visual description. I've got no idea. My head's saying something like, Go on. Is it going to be like booby shirt, like uh, Adam said <laughs> last week? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more like along the line of, of like paint, but then I, I suppose that's not paint. It's not. Uh, it's got to be food, something food based. I can't. I can't give you any clues, mate. I can only give clues on the third one when I don't let anybody walk away without a star. Duncan, you look like you're going to guess. You've already had yours, so I'm just trying to think, so I'm ready for the next one. (laughs) I'm gonna have to pass on that, that's a bit Okay, okay. Um (laughs) final review. Gave it to my daughter. I can't play this, it's for kids. Oh Roblox? Roblox, no. No, it's not Roblox. And I think, uh, gave it to my daughter, I can't play it. It's not a free game either. But it is a game. Damn it. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that, there's, your, there's your extra clue. It's a game. It's a very, very popular game. I haven't played it myself. It's got to be something like Candy Crush, hasn't it? <sighs> uh, is it Animal Crossing? It is Animal Crossing. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one star for Ben. Next product, first review. Every time I use it, I get indentations on my bum for at least 45 minutes. Really <laughs> uncomfortable. Stop giggling before I finish the clue. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with the foam roller, surely. Foam roller? Roll, roll, what? Ruler? Why did I say ro- roller? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's not right. It's not right. <laughs> you got why, spot, Chris. I don't know why I said that. Oh, roller. Really? <laughs> I don't even know where they pronounce that. Roller. <laughs> I'm going to go bike saddle. Oh, that's an old guess, isn't it? I think you did that for the uh, slip and slide. Before, but I mean, this is giving, like, specifically, it's affecting the bum oh, area. Bum <laughs> area. <laughs> no, it's not. Next one. Poorly made, cold, hard, and narrow. It, it, does, it does fall under the bike saddle again, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> These make so much sense when you can actually see the product. 
I'm not sure I want to see the product. Um. <laughs> What's going through your head, Ben? Because I never ask this of contestants, but what what pictures are going through your head? Anything that you can sit on. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, is it a garden bench? No. Oh. Are you going to pass again, Ben? Um, yeah, I'm going to have to pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is very good on this, Ben. <laughs> Absolutely shocking. Last review. I go like clockwork every single day, and now because of this, I dread it. Toilet seat. Yes, yes. Oh, thank <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> what what wrong toilet seat leaves indentations <laughs> on your ass? Well, I didn't. <laughs> when I looked at it, does uh, it go <laughs> grip? <laughs> no, that's the thing. It just it just looked like a budget toilet seat, but there must have been some I don't know people with rather large like behinds that yeah. have bought it and then got indentations. But it looks unless it's one of those where you you know when you see a product on Amazon or eBay, and then what turns up is completely different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could have been something like that, but oh, uh, it's a cheap toy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sat badly on the actual rim. Uh, it and must it be. for about a week until I sat down one day and it actually managed to pinch my leg between the, oh. the seat and the, the porcelain of the toilet. And you, ah! And of course, everyone in the house is like, what the hell's going on in there? Oh, <laughs> I can't imagine that. <laughs> How would you get out of that as well? <laughs> without just without just pulling the skin away, uh, how do you get out? You can't really stand up, can you? While it's it's there, oh, your reflexes take over you. You get up pretty quick, oh. <laughs> leaving half your leg behind you. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> next, uh, next product, first review. An iron is more effective than this cheap knockoff. Radiator. Radiator. No. And he's got some great guesses. I feel bad that he's only got two stars. <laughs> I'm thinking a steam press thing, like when I was... You're doing the hand movements again. <laughs> <laughs> at least at least it's not this way this time. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's not a steam press thing. Um, another good guess, but no. Uh, second review. I thought it was doing its job until I realised after a week my hair was like straw. The straightener. Straighteners, yes. Ben, well done. <laughs> That's really, really good. So, should we not mention the score this week? We won't have the I'm not ben. saying that was the lowest score ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I forgot. He's gonna he's gonna want to have a pop in me. So we'll show you the score uh, when the episode airs, so you don't get too down. Just forget about it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is really backfired. We managed to depress the guest before we really. Got <laughs> this is it's actually pretty humble of Duncan because usually he goes right in at the guests if they've got a low score. You'll really you'll either turn around and go, oh, you're right at the top of the leaderboard, or then he'll tell them uh, turn around to the ones that have only got sort of five or four stars and go, you're right at the bottom. You're right at the bottom. So <laughs> at least he's honest. Um, thanks for coming on, Ben. You uh, you have started. Is it Ram Ramblings of Autistic? So Ram Ramblings of Autistic, yeah. Ramblings of Autistic. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Essentially, it's all my essentially ramblings, all the thoughts and things that I put around in my head. I kind of see it as like a translation between an autistic and a neurotypical brain. Yeah. I do my best to try and describe my, how situations feel for me, but in ways that somebody without autism could understand. So it's like that translation between between the two, because obviously it's, it's an extremely hard condition to get your head around. Even yeah. somebody like me that's got it, and I'd say I've got a pretty good grasp on on the understanding side of it, but it still uh, still fails me pretty much every day. <laughs> it doesn't just go away then. You can't just turn it off like a switch. <laughs> Unfortunately not. There's no, uh, you know, it's not like a pull card Woody. <laughs> <laughs> You were uh, you. I, I watched a, a couple of your videos, and uh, Duncan did a video with you uh, a while back on PDA Dad channel. You're a dep is it deputy care manager? Deputy manager of a care home, yeah, for uh, people with autism and uh, challenging behaviours, some mental health. 
Does that give you an advantage then, uh, uh, almost experiencing on some level what, what they're going through or understanding what they're going through? I think it, it equally has its ups and its downs uh, in the sense that, you know, it's great that I can look at somebody's behaviour and put a great analysis to it on why I might do that or what what behaviours they're doing might kind of make me think, what would I get for that if I did it? And it, it's something that I tell parents to do. Like one of the biggest questions that gets asked is, is this stimming? Is this that? Is this, you know, whatever? And I always say, give it a go. See what you get. And if you get anything from it, then it's probably whatever you're thinking it is. And it, it kind of does allow me to do that for the guys that I work with. But I mean, equally as you, as you can imagine, the autism also has its downsides to my job. Just turning up to work can be a bit difficult some days. Um, and I, I absolutely love my job. <laughs> Just trying to get up and function through those normal routines that everybody has is uh, sometimes just a bit a bit harder some days than it is for other days. How, I mean, how did you get into it? When you, it's, it's an interesting, for me, it's an interesting yeah. idea that, you know, obviously someone who's lived with autism on a very personal level all his life to then take that on board and actually get into caring for other people who struggle with the same issues. How did that happen for you? Was it, was it a natural thing? Was it something that you sort of decided one day, oh, I'm going to do this? And, you know. <laughs> I think uh, as much as the autism does make me have those very impulsive thoughts of, I'm going to do this today. Um, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to write a book in six weeks. Um, <laughs> it, it kind of all happened by accident. I mean, I suppose I was always destined to do something along these lines. My mum's a, a social worker. Um, instead of growing up reading the uh, Biff, Chip and Kipper, I think it is, I was you know, reading psychology books, just because it's more interesting to me anyway. You yeah, say the different thing is interesting <laughs> to read them with my son at the moment oh my gosh yeah um yeah so it kind of happened as an accident i obviously i had a di well i'm saying obviously it's not very obvious but for most people that they have a very difficult time through school especially secondary school and that's where i had an awful lot of issues because when you're in secondary school i think you're very, you're very close to that line of being an adult, but nobody quite treats you like one. You know? Almost patronising, isn't it? Well, extremely, yeah. I was extremely patronised. Patronised, I was sort of labelled in, in the wrong sense, not the autistic sense. I was just labelled as a pain, essentially. And then I started doing these talks with uh, an old friend that is autistic as well, um, and we started doing sort of teacher awareness um, and, and training teachers on kind of how it feels and what they can do, things like that. And then I was in college and something that I've always, always, always struggled with is language. I really struggle with language and imagination. Again, because of the autism, I'm very black and white. Uh, one of my English teachers said I had the imagination of a dodo. <laughs> and extinct bird. Oh, not, but that's mm -hmm. awful. And I'll never, I'll never forget that day ever. That's really ingrained. What did they say that in relation to, though? Was it a project or something? Or yeah, it was. Um, you had to write a short story. Uh, the actual exercise was to get you into writing paragraphs. Right. Uh, and then understanding of when a new paragraph starts and when when it ends. Um, and I sat there for 45 minutes, absolutely at a brick wall. I'd written about three words. And, and, and that's how they reacted. I mean, it's, yeah. no, but it's, it's no surprise I'm highly critical of the education sector. But I think it's, it's one of these, uh, you hear these stories um, of, of, of similar to yours, the education sector letting down um, children. And this doesn't go just for uh, um, ND children either. It's neurotypical as well. But I think it's got to a stage, especially with some teachers, because this isn't this isn't sort of an age old thing. This is it's fairly new when you talk about sort of um, disabilities. 
is, is fairly new. And I think there's teachers out there that have been stuck in the ages for so long that they don't feel there's anything left to learn. And I think that's when they, they let down the children. And not, you, like I said, you hear these stories and it's always uh, a teacher that's been in the job for years and years and years. And they've got this huge chip on their shoulder and they feel that they know everything about teaching. And then all of a sudden something new comes along and they're just flat out refuse it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of schools actually get into big trouble is because of their, uh, their stubbornness to learn. And that's what they should be a- aiming for every day is, is to improve and to learn themselves to teach children but we see it on a on a on a constant basis well is how do you get from having a child that's brought into this world if you look at um you know toddlers look at how much they love to march around and pick up new things and learn and that there's a real thirst for learning and wanting to do better and pick things up there so we take that we put them through our educational system and they track all this way through our educational system. And by the time they get to the middle of it, they absolutely hate learning. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, um, it's not entertaining. It's not, and it does play a big part. I know it sounds silly, but the entertainment of learning plays a huge part for some children. There is some children out there that can sit at a desk, you can throw a book at them, and they will learn everything from that book there's other children like I was when I was in school you throw that book I'll make it through the first page and I will carry on reading but I will not ingest anything in that book uh, and in fact and I was I was talking to the wife this morning when we took the kids in on the way back I said that my, my biggest downfall was uh, I, I would have a book I would read and then almost uh, a few seconds after I'd switched off I would realise I'm reading the words, but not taking nothing in whatsoever. And yep. uh, it's a rigid um, education system that they've got that just doesn't work for everybody. You cannot blanket education. It has to be tailored in some way to each individual child. It does. And that was a, a huge thing that I did with the teachers. Were One of the biggest things when I was teaching them about autism and everything else was so many times we forget just to ask the individual if i'm having a meltdown yeah maybe don't approach me at that moment because i'm the same as anybody if you're up there nobody's coming in there nobody's going to talk any sense to you because you're just too out of it but once i come back down and i can sit and have a normal you know a a standard conversation with you then yeah absolutely i'll explain why i was annoyed but don't be upset if I'm going to tell you the truth. The issue is the question you don't want the answer to. It's exactly. Like a rule of life. If you're going to ask that question to someone, regardless of age, you've got to be prepared to listen to the answer. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you ask me if you know what's upset me, and I say you, don't be offended. You've asked me. <laughs> it's, a, it's frail egos, though, isn't it? That's that's what it's about. It's frail egos. If somebody turned around and went, oh, I'm upset by you, they, they feel like it's attacked them and not to dig deeper or to let the situation calm down and then and then ask when the karma, uh, what was the issue? Well, it was you, you had done this or uh, them turning around and saying it was you and them not carrying the conversation on to dig deeper to see why they set off because it could be something that they didn't realise that was completely innocent. Um, yeah, they, they, they don't want the answer. They don't want to dig deeper. They just heard you and they take offence. When, when I was training with teachers in college, I was treated like an adult. I um, was really treated like an adult and I really excelled in college. Um, and one of the exercises was to write about something that you're passionate about in English. Well, we already know my history of, of English and being able to write. So I sat there for about 40, 45 minutes and, uh, and my tutor, Philippa, said, you can't just sit there and write nothing. I said, well, I've got nothing that I'm passionate about. And she said, of course you have. You're, you're passionate about autism. <laughs> Did you start writing? Write, or? Yeah, so she gave me the basics to, of what to write. It didn't have to be imaginary. Uh, excuse me. It didn't have to be from my imagination. It, it just had to be something that I was passionate about. And I'm passionate about autism and, and learning and 
why teachers aren't given any help. You know, because let's, let's face it, it's not just the teacher's fault. A lot of it is based on their training. I've come across some absolutely fabulous teachers throughout sort of my schooling years that have taken it upon themselves to learn. And oh, it absolutely. Absolutely. I, I can't agree more. It, it, it's basically asking someone who's an English teacher and is focusing on university and college and everything to get uh, the degrees to become a teacher and then turn around to them and say, right, here's your French class. Um, th it's not going to work, is it? It's, it, it's, it, it starts from the top down and it, and it has to have um, those, those people that know giving the information and knowing exactly what teachers need to be be able to give the training in the first place. Exactly. Um, and that's a big thing that I wrote about in the letter was because uh, it was supposed to be to your local MP, you know, and I, you know, in my head I knew this was fake, but it was the exercise that I was asked to do, so I did it. I was asked by the teacher if uh, she could send my letter to the MP, and that's what she did, and I ended up um, working alongside Nigel Adams at the time and David Cameron uh, to deliver the training to the teachers. That's a um, huge name drop. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's a that's a hell of a name drop. It was really really fun uh, to an extent. Um, it had its issues along with everything else, but it allowed me to get out there and spread the message. And the the one thing that I, I set out to do was, if I make one teacher, just one one person, it doesn't even have to be a teacher. If I make one of them sit down and think, how does autism change people's lives? And I've won. I've got one extra person on the planet to sit there and think yeah. about all of its effects. I've won. That's, that's exactly what we're about with this. It's it is, but do because uh, obviously we, we've said before that we think that um, disability sh it should be a subject in school. With everything that's taught in school and what we actually take away from school, uh, the subject of disabilities and understanding and uh, and that falls right from phys physical and mental. That if it was taught in schools, those stigmas would be taken away. Uh, people would know when there's a child that's having a meltdown in a supermarket. Eventually, the generations would catch up to a point where it wouldn't be someone walking along and going, oh, look at them. Um, they they need a smack on the arse or whatever from previous generations. We, we'd actually get caught up. And people would be able to identify because of what they learned in school and say, it looks like he's having a meltdown. Let's give him some space. Yeah, I, mean, I was called Rhino Boy for five years in primary school. Rhino Boy? Yeah, all because I ran at somebody when I was angry. Wow, that, that that's... <laughs> I mean, it's kids, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. kids. But that, that's quite unimaginative, to be fair. I mean, if the names I could have been called for some of the stuff I did in school, my God. Yeah, <laughs> Rhino, yeah. Rhino Boy would be tame for me. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I'd quite like Rhino Boy. It's better than what I usually got called. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the names. Kamikaze, I think, would have been suitable for me, <laughs> the stupid stuff I did. But, um, yeah, it's uh, very unimaginative. Can I ask, Ben, so... That's a really interesting sort of a pocket of information there that you've, this, it sounds like that was like a really, um, like a linchpin moment in your life, if, if, if you like. Because you obviously got on, I know you, it's on pause at the moment, but you I mean, you've been writing a book. Yeah. That has come with no imagination or the imagination of, I can't remember what the, that teacher said to you, but you've gone on, like, talk about a big, to the, the people who have trying to push you, pull you back and hold you down. You've taken something which was a real struggle for you, but you're actually writing books and, and, and putting this message out there. How, I mean, how did that come about? What, it, was that part of that process, I guess? I've always, always, always been told by people that I should write my story and, you know, this, that and the other. But when it's coming from friends and when it's coming from family, it doesn't really... Is it the pity thing you know and regardless of what you do they're going to say it's good yeah like yeah. you know you could burn a lasagna and feed them it and they'd still eat it <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the job so you, you never i never took that seriously um and then um the amount of times that i've pulled up in a supermarket car park and had an absolute meltdown of a, what I could only assume was breathing. 
honestly, absolutely no idea to this day why why sometimes it happens. I'll pull up in Morrison's and I'll just, that'll be it. I won't be able to leave the car for an hour and a half or whatever. And really? I'll just, yeah, I'll just sit and ball my eyes out for an hour. But, but that comes back to the, you know, it, it's okay not to be okay. Everybody struggles. Everybody's got that difficulty. Do you do you get do you get any answers after it's over? Do you do you realise what brought it on? Some of them, I'm just left with the it happened and you've got to get on with it. Okay. You know, there's, you know, there's people in far worse situations. There's soldiers that have fought for us that have lost the leg. You know, and I'm sat here in a car park worrying about why I've cried. It's not yeah. really big. It's when I started the ramblings. Um, was I pulled up in a, a Sainsbury's car park, so it's not just limited to Morrison's. Um, <laughs> okay. yeah. they get, they're getting their fair share of tears from you. You're spreading them out evenly through the car parks. Yeah. These. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Don't, don't there. worry, Tesco's, you're next. It's fine. <laughs> just look out for Ben crying in the car park. <laughs> pulled up in the Sainsbury's, and I just had this overwhelming horrible dark cloud that kind of loomed over just like it does and one of the massive things that you know my granddad uh, he struggles with some things he always says write things down um my mum's always said to me write things down and i just sat in the car park and i just thought i'm gonna write it down i'm gonna write down everything that i'm going through right now and that's what I did. I wrote it down on uh, on a status on Facebook, <laughs> and I just thought, why not share it? Did Did it help you when you were writing it down? Did it Did it draw you away? Uh, did it defer from how you were feeling that you were almost getting it out on a page? Um, did it help? I feel like uh, I was kind of on a roller coaster, um, and my, my normal breakdowns are a bit like the dodgems. Okay. You're strapped in, you've got no control, it's going to spin out of here, there and everywhere. You've just got no control over it. But I feel like writing it down kind of took it from a dodgings to like the corkscrew where you're properly strapped in, you know what's going to happen, you know what's coming, and you just fasten down a bit more. Because you can either let it rule you or you can rule it. So, so uh, was it a type of like preparation you kind of knew and you were bracing yourself? Yeah, I was kind of just, as I was writing, I was kind of riding the motion of it. Like a, a but, running commentary of, of how you were feeling. Yeah, and I think in some ways it probably took me a bit darker than that specific meltdown would have gone. But I feel like that helped anyway, because I was able to get it out. And of course, people really, really enjoyed that, tran- well, not enjoyed that translation, but was sort of excited to see the difference and how it does affect people because obviously it's a very hard thing to describe to somebody has anybody come out and said they've had anything similar um with, with what you wrote down as, as someone said oh I've, I've felt like how you felt or similar to how you felt yeah um there's been a few that have said things like that because uh, obviously it, autism affects people in so many different ways you're going to go few and far between to find somebody that has the exact same uh, traits and, of and things. Of um, but actually, one of the other uh, modmins on the autism page, they, they struggle very similar to how I do. We do the same sorts of things to calm down, things like that, which is cool. It blows me away. What I really like is that, because you often write pieces that go on to the page, just, and I always get so much insight from it because... I, I've said so many times, I, I'd kill for the opportunity just to have a day in my daughter's head, not because I want to suffer the way she does with her, you know, difficulties and challenges, but to be able to understand from the inside would make the world a difference. And I kind of get that from your writing a lot. When you yeah. write these down, I'm able to read it and I, I get an inside perspective. I find this talking to autistic people in general. I think that there's a stigmatism almost that, you can't communicate with autistic people. <laughs> yeah. but the, I get so much from talking to yourself and other autistic friends because I get that inside perspective and it helps me to understand what she's facing in a, such a more intimate way. I understand it. I'll never experience it the way she does, but it gives me those glimpses and really helps me 
to overcome a lot of the challenges that we get hit with because she can't express it at the moment. I mean, yeah, it's, it's magic what you do. It is. Obviously your, your mum, I'm assuming reads your work when she can and, and, and does the different bits. Did she ever, did she ever react negatively to any of your work when you mentioned her of things she did or didn't do, or did she understand that it wasn't criticism, but it was your thoughts at the time? No, I think it's very important to, to say that my mum does not read one thing before it gets posted. So she does not get a heads up at all about what I'm going to say about anything. And obviously, you know, we talk about it because, again, it is about talking. Um, but have I offended her? Probably, as she told me. No, because we don't, we don't argue like that. We have a conversation yeah. and she'll say, well, can you see why I've done or why I had to do this or that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I talk a lot about restraint because everybody's like, oh, restraint, 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 stay away from restraint. Well, as somebody that uses, you know, not necessarily restraint, but certainly, you know, because restraint is a very broad umbrella. We don't just, when we're using restraint, it's all about de-escalation. It's not just about grabbing somebody. Yeah. Um, but for somebody that's been restrained and uses restraint on a daily basis, I think it's really beneficial. Am I glad that my mum restrained me? Absolutely. Do I have any negative thoughts towards or about her restraining me? None at all. It's, it's one of those things with the restraint. It's a very touchy subject, isn't it? Because oh, I think if you, if you don't know about it, it can be uh, confused for um, almost causing harm to the individual. But it's, it's just that stigma that people don't realise the situation before a safe restraint is carried out. And people assume yeah. restraint, it, that when they hear restraint, they think of that full-on... Bouncer mean, in a nightclub. You never see the image on TV of one person who's in a, uh, what they call a low-level hole where they're just holding the arms carefully. But it's almost like a hug. And it's no, you know... It, that's a form of restraint, but you're just keeping the arms safe, but you're actually keeping the person close. People automatically think the stuff that you see presented whenever it's talked about is always the, there's five people and some poor person on the ground writhing. And like you say, you don't know the lead up to it, but you also, that's the only image that gets presented. Whereas there's so many other forms of restraint that are so much gentler and so much more supportive in a way to, than what we think, you know, if it gets to that, that there's usually a reason. For it. When you see restraint and, and it does make its way onto mainstream media or something like that, it's sensationalized. And, yeah. and you know, because it's sensationalized, it always looks horrific. If it was in the case of what you just said, Duncan, where it was in this calm and supportive manner, it would be nowhere near the TV stations or the newspapers. It has to be something that looks horrific. There are places that have abused restraint and that's clear. Yeah. And that's what sucks, but it doesn't... So it gets painted in a really bad light because people have abused that responsibility. I've been, ex I've been restrained by the police in a very wrong way, just, again, because I was autistic. Not because of anything around, because they touched me and I flinched. Because I don't like physical contact. So as somebody, as an officer, went to touch me, I went like that. And the next thing I know, was four of them on top of me. Coming from somebody that's had it both ways, that somebody where I've been restrained in the very wrong way and the very right way, I like restraint because it makes me feel comfortable in the sense that when I'm up there and there's nothing that control me, do you really think that my brain has the power to control itself? It doesn't. You're way, way up there. There is no, there's nothing on the earth that is going to make my brain in that moment go, that's a person that you love, don't hurt them. Yeah. You're just up there, there's no, no control. So if somebody can take back that control and say, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, we're going to sit here and, and make it safe for everybody, then absolutely take control for me because that's only going to make my brain come down faster. Absolutely, yeah. And, and again, even with that uh, altercation with the police, you can't tell me that they were they were trained or knew anything about your condition or could even identify um, or the the reason why um, you you did what you did. And again, this goes back to to the education in schools because even if they hadn't have taken the, the path of police officer and they knew what uh, the, your reaction 
could have been something like that, they could have handled it in a completely different way. But we just get let down so, so badly. And I, I genuinely fear for my son uh, how society will react. Um, that's heartbreaking. How did your mum um, react to that when, when she heard about it? She was there. Um, oh, she was there? Essentially, it was a fight between me and a friend and the police got called. I left and went home. Uh, the police turned up. Um, and originally, it was just two officers, I think. No, one officer. And he was very pig-headed, very arrogant, very, I'm the police officer, you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. Um, my mum had told told him about the autism, said that she would go, go upstairs, talk to me. And, you know, I do understand it from a police's point of view. Essentially, somebody upstairs that they want to talk to. Um, are you really going to trust the family member to go up and get them? Probably not, but when they're only 13, 14, I think it's... how old you were? Yeah. Oh, God. Um, yeah, it was just madness. And then, because I wouldn't come out, they called uh, back up. So four, four police officers, well, five in total now, um, came. And then, so my mum had talked to me, I'd agree, well, I haven't agreed because when I, I have a meltdown, I do the auto-selective mute, so I can't talk. It's not a choice. I physically, I just... I can't do it. The most you'll get from me is just a little bobs. Yeah. That's as much as I can get my brain to, to do because my body's so tense. So I sat on the stairs, putting my shoes on because she'd asked me to do it. She said, right, all you're going to do is walk outside, walk to the van and sit in the back. Not a problem. And as we were walking towards the van, one on either side had, had tried to grab hold of my wrists. And obviously... I'm hypersensitive to touch. It, it can cause pain more than anything. It's like an actual pain inside. It's obvious I flinched and that was it. There was, uh, they were trying to jump on top of me. Um, and my, it was as my mum had turned around to lock the door. Was, was it ever, uh, but did she take it further? Did she make complaints? Was, was there a, a, an investigation? Uh, and, and if so, what was the outcome? Uh, complaints were made. Um, one of the officers who didn't appear to agree with it from the beginning because he was stood right at the back the entire time. You could tell he, he kind of just didn't want to be in the situation. He took us, or brought us home uh, and apologised on the way. Essentially, it took a solicitor to walk in because they put me in a, actually, a suicide watch room. So they put me in a glass room with, uh, I just remember it being freezing. My tolerance of hot and cold is huge, so I don't really have a, an internal thermometer as such. I just remember it being freezing. I sat there hours and hours and hours until the solicitor was finally called. And they said that it wasn't the right place for me and they had to let me go. So that's what they did. Listen, I've, worked, I've worked in um, medium secure hospital. So obviously part of that was working with the police. Through my job now, I still have contact with the police occasionally. I've got friends that are police officers that are good at the job, you know. And there are some really good police officers, likewise with the teachers. There are some good ones out there. But if I met them on the street today over something, I would still be extremely, extremely dubious because that's just what it's created. I kind of guess it, it helps with that mission of wanting to change one person's perspective in the sense that, if I change one person's perspective and they talk to somebody else who talks to somebody else, yeah, it'll end up like Chinese whispers, but at least the name autism or the word autism would be out there and might cause somebody else to look up on Google or whatever. Have you had any notable success where somebody's implemented something or has had you in on a regular basis? Have you had anything that you, you've made real change, some big change? Just with the people that I work with, it's kind of massive I had a meet or met with somebody um, when I was in college. So essentially, we're talking almost 10 years ago. Uh, last week, somebody else used my name whilst talking to this parent. So in college, I, I met with this um, parent of somebody, well, two people with autism. She asked me for advice and, and things like that. So we spoke about autism and how it can affect. And we spoke about the coping cup that um, me and Duncan have spoken about before. Um, and all the different strategies and things and how he might be perceiving things that we wouldn't perceive in that way because obviously our thought processes, well, essentially our, our minds are just wired very differently. 
So we spoke about all that, and somebody else used my name and said, oh, so-and-so. Um, and, and the parent was just like, oh, my God. He made all the difference to my kids. And I, I'll tell you what, what threw me more was I met with her after that. And she remembered what I'd said almost word for, well, in fact, almost better than I'd remembered what I'd said. Mm-hmm. And to know that I'd made that much difference mm-hmm. in just two people's lives, well, three people's lives. That's amazing. Just, yeah. If there was one thing that you could draw on right now, and you, if you could communicate something to parents now about what it's like living with autism and maybe how the relationship is with parents, I mean, what would that be? I think first of all, you've got to imagine for an MT person, we'll talk about driving, for instance. So when you go out driving and you know that traffic lights, red means stop, green means go, amber means get ready or wait or whatever that in-between land is. Don't don't get in a car with Ben, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) You know what every task means. You know what um, those lights mean. But when I wake up on a morning, I don't know what those lights mean. Those lights are brand new to me. It's like I knew the I knew the rules yesterday, but today when I've woken up, for some reason green means stop and red means go because that's how much social rules and social social cues change and dictate what we do. And that's obviously very confusing in itself. I suppose the other thing that I would really like to draw on is that a lot of people have that question of, do they love me? They've never said it. Do they really appreciate what they do? And well, obviously, of course we do. It's just love for me is very different. How do I know what love is? If I don't know what happiness is or sad is, um, because you know all the emotions I never knew. It's like the entire world got together in a little meeting before I was born. And they all had this meeting and decided what feeling was what and what rule was what and how they was going to react to somebody dying and how they was going to react to somebody that suffered a loss or something like that. And for some reason, nobody took notes and nobody wanted to give me the memo. I think that the love thing, that, that, that really annoys me, this one. Um, when, when someone first told me about it, it smacks of a desperation that you need to be told by your child that they they love you in a traditional way. The fact that they would come into you in the morning shows that they love you. The fact they would ask for your help shows that they love you. My son, he he I can't remember the last time he said it, but that doesn't mean that I am sort of drawn in enough to say, oh, does he love me enough? I think there's a thing in there though that we have different love languages. I, I've spoken mm-hmm. about this before. It's, it's actually it's a Christian guy who, who wrote this thing about the five love languages. And that, um, and, but I think it relates to anybody. It doesn't matter what you believe. The actual concept behind it is just so rock solid because you've got words of affirmation, acts of service, time spent, physical touch. And these are the different forms of com- the ways we communicate love. And for some people, that words of affirmation is their primary love language. If you know what somebody else's love language is, then you can communicate with them in that way. But they may not understand it if you're only communicating in your love language. So if my love language is words of affirmation, which it actually is, I need to hear, I love you. And so hearing that from my daughter or my son makes a huge difference. It really impacts me. Uh, My wife, her love language is time spent. So actually spending time, quality time, makes a big difference. I need to be able to communicate that I love my wife in that way by actually spending time because that's her love language that she's going to understand from me. And I think that's where people get stuck. They don't realise that there are these different ways that we communicate love. And so they think their kids don't love them because they're not communicating in their own personal primary love language. And you've got to be able to take a step back. And I recommend anybody to read the book that that this guy wrote on it. And I think once you see that, you'll start seeing, like you're saying, Chris, you, you, start, you know because your kids come into you and giving you a hug in the morning, so that's physical contact. He has said, I love you in the past, but I, I never needed that, uh, that 
for him to to say it in a way that I understand. I I always knew my son, and regardless as well, I don't want anybody taking offence to this because for me, my son, regardless <laughs> if he loved me or not, I I'd still be there. It, it wouldn't oh, matter to me, even if he uh, and he said it before. He's oh, daddy, I don't love you, and you're the worst, and and everything else. I. I, I don't care. He is the single most important thing in my life. Regardless of what he says to me, I will still be there. And I will still acknowledge that in some way he does love me. I think it's challenging though, isn't it? Like, I know that if somebody was coming at me, hitting me every day, throwing things at me every day, just generally being annoyed at me every day, you know, it would become a bit difficult to... Uh, appreciate that they do love you but my mum uh, probably said it once to my mum i think that's what most parents do is that they 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 see from a different language like like duncan said that they see through and past their own love language to identify that their child loves them that's it everyone thank you so much for joining us thanks as always to chris Thank you very much, mate. And uh, a massive thank you to Ben today. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, buddy. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's been good. Look, please do like this episode. Please do put it in the comments. We'd love to hear your experiences. If you're autistic and you've had experiences with police or teachers or something that you want to share, positives and negatives, put them in the comments. Please do subscribe to our channel. It makes a huge difference in getting this out there. And we will see you again next time.